Uh, so, Guy, um, before I uh, before we kind of jump in uh, and deal with the sort of first question, um, you've been in the, in the lo local search industry essentially since 2008. So, you know, what is that, 11, uh, 11 or 12 years now? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a long time, uh, longer than I've been uh, in the industry. Um, you run two agencies. One of them is specializes uh, in legal marketing or marketing for legal practices called Attorney Sync. Um, maybe just tell us a little bit more about your experience um, in general, sort of SEO running an agency. And, and then maybe your kind of views on link building as a topic and as a concept. Sure, so uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for everybody who's attending. Um, I used to be a trial lawyer and this like 2005 and I kind of challenged this idea in legal that people wouldn't use the internet to hire lawyers. Uh, and we still run into that sometimes, but that's a story for another day. So we started an agency, uh, really focused on driving local results for law firms. We have mostly solo and small law firms, US and Canada. We haven't jumped across the pond yet. Um, but yeah, and my I'm big on links. I, I always tell people I'm not a search engineer. I'm not an information retrieval engineer. I just see what makes law firm sites and other businesses sites pop into local results. And most of the time, if you get the table stakes right, it's links is what makes the difference. In terms of your client base, obviously focused purely on legal, uh, we've got a very different legal system in the UK to, to the US, uh, as much as I can understand uh, the sort of differences without knowing the law in too much depth. Um, are most of the clients you work with single location businesses or do you have multi-location practices as well? Both, um, <clears throat> you know, some firm, there's national firms, regional firms, and then just your single location solos and small firms. Okay, interesting. So we can talk a lot, you get a lot of breadth. And the legal industry is, is such a competitive industry. Um, do you find it to be competitive, you know, across all the locations your clients work in? Um, or, you know, is it sort of major cities is much, much more competitive than, than smaller towns? Yeah, I mean, anywhere that there's any population density, it's super competitive. Um, unless you're in a more niche practice area and you're really in the middle of nowhere, uh, it's pretty competitive. Um, and you know, Google's getting better. We can, something we'll talk about is like proximity and stuff, but uh, for the most part, it's still really competitive. Uh, and where your office is located is making more of more of a impact on how you're gonna appear. Okay, so think about links specifically then. Uh, and we start, I guess, on a very sort of top level. Um, how do you think about the this sort of thing that we call link building as a task? I mean, do you see it as a, a, a task to be done uh, with a kind of a clear objective or do you see links as the byproducts of other activities um, that you do for clients or you encourage your clients to do so uh, both um, you know I, I think someone said this uh, a while ago but this I think it was about Rand Fishkin uh, you know his best link building tool he can just click publish and all of a sudden he's got a bunch of links and there are people that can do that and that's great. And so they have natural digital PR built in and their sources of great information. And I think local business owners should be thinking like that too, creating content that naturally draws attention. And even in legal, we work with firms that uh, have become experts in their topic and they publish on the topic and they get great links. And that's awesome. That doesn't happen for most small business owners. And so for most, it's a grind. Do you think most business owners can get to that position of authority where everything they publish gets linked to because you know people are following them and trust them? I think on a really hyper local level, that's their best bet. The answer is no, not everybody can because not everybody wants to have that role in their business. Not everybody is a great publisher or writer, is great on video. And so it's not realistic to think that if, you know, hey, I just want to spend time doing what I do, that I'm going to go out and publish and become this great expert. And, that, and that's why I say both, because if you can do it, you should, but it's not right for everybody. And um, so th there's a, there are ways you can build links and develop visibility locally that don't require you to become the Rand Fishkin of your local community. Okay, and we're absolutely going to get on to uh, that tactical stuff uh, in a second. Um, but it's interesting that you you kind of talk about um, 
you know, from the kind of client's view, different types of clients, maybe some are more outgoing, uh, they're, they're into sort of sort of self-publicity. Um, how, big a, how big a part of, you know, is client education uh, when thinking about links, uh, you know, in terms of explaining, you know, the base level why links are important uh, and should be seeked uh, and, um, you know, how, how a client can get involved or needs to get involved. How do you, how do you approach that? It's huge. Uh... Uh, one from a just making sure that they're making informed decisions. We're really big on getting clients sign off on what we do on their behalf, especially in legal. There are all sorts of in the United States. Each state has rules of professional con- uh, rules of professional conduct, and um, we want to make sure that we're doing our best to uh, represent those firms the way they want to be represented. And so it's a huge undertaking to educate. Uh, there's ways you can streamline that. You can put training modules in place, video training, send them resources. But it's I'm very reluctant to tell clients like, oh, hey, we're just going to go out and build links, trust us to build links without at least getting a um, some common language about what we're doing, why we're doing and the impact of what we're doing. But we're also very careful because we don't sell links like that. So we don't say things like, oh, we're going to build you 10 domain authority, 80 links this month. Um, and that's something else we can talk about, but we're really not focused on link quantity or uh, proxy metrics like domain authority when it comes to local link building. So what are you focused on then? What, you know, I guess, you know, how do you set about um, setting yourself targets uh, and knowing whether you're doing a good job in this space? So we start with uh, topical and geographical relevance for our link prospecting. So what that means is we're looking for sites that we might be able to earn a link from that are either on the same topic as our client site um, or that are in the same location. So I always say for a, a local law firm, one of the best places you can get a link from would be your direct competitor down the street, right? They have a site that's topically the same as yours. They're in the same area as yours. Of course, good luck trying to get a lawyer down the street who's competing with you to try to link to you. So then you start to back up and you say, okay, well, maybe you're a uh, personal injury lawyer and you say, okay, I'm going to look for uh, physical uh, rehabilitation centers because not only are some of the content that's published there relevant to the people who are going to be coming to us, uh, those also might be a good place to have some publicity that actually might generate some traffic or actually some clients back to you. That's another thing that comes into our analysis is like, is this link prospect also going to be a source of business or leads or uh, attention? Okay. And um, yeah, I guess how, how far do you, how far do you kind of take that sort of uh, concentric rings out? If you're starting with you know, someone who is just like you, i.e. a competitor, very hard, and then you kind of build it out. Um, yeah, you know, how, how maybe talk through some of the I guess the kind of the rings that you would, you'd build out for a typical client. Yeah, and it varies really based on the location. So if you're in a smaller community, think hyper local. Like really, you I mean you you can go pull up your business on Google Maps and start setting different radii and say, okay, let's see what it looks like at five miles out, ten miles out, fifty miles out. You know, if there's nothing around you, fifty miles out. There's probably no point in including that in your prospecting. Um, so if you're in a small community, hyper, hyper local, five miles, a mile away from your office, focus on those businesses. In fact, I, I think Google Maps is such a great link building tool for prospecting because you can just see the other businesses that are around your neighborhood uh, and start adding them to your prospect list and figure out ways that you can actually earn links from them. Bigger uh, cities, or if you work in a metro, or if you have multi-office location, or you're uh, you got suburban communities that you want to serve. Uh, you got to throw all that in there. So it, it really depends on what kind of resource allocation you have. It r- depends on where you are in the competitive environment. If you're just getting started, you better build a big list because if you want to rank for competitive head terms in legal in Chicago, you're going to need a lot of quality local links. Um, but if you're in a less competitive community or less competitive uh, practice area or business model, you probably can start and just start inside very local, hyper local, and then grow that those concentral circles out. And I guess top level, how, how important to the overall success of a client do you see the acquisition of links? Very. Um, you know, the, the only thing that I've seen beat links is spam. 
right? So most of the time, and I challenge folks, if you're in a competitive business in a competitive market and you have sites that are not spam and they don't have any links, send them over my way. I'd love to see it because 90% of the time, most of the sites that appear in both local pack results and traditional localized results have a significant solid backlink profile. Yeah, okay. I like that quote. Anything that beats links is spam. Um, <laughs> we will, uh, I, will, I will look to use that. And spam um, does beat links, unfortunately. It does. If anybody at Google's watching. At least, you, at least you can address it. Uh, and obviously Google has just announced days, you, know, you can now report name spam. Uh, via the addressable form. So, uh, you know, we've got a little post coming out from Ben Fisher about that. So that's, you know, a kind of sort of step forward. Out of interest, do you, is spam fighting a tactic that you undertake at your agency? Yeah, unfortunately, it's become a bigger part of what we do, but um, it, that works too. That, you know, it reshuffles the deck. So you knock a couple of listings out and mm. you can go from deep in the listings to into the pack. Yeah. It's interesting. We've got Joy Hawkins uh, from Sterling Sky on in a couple of weeks, uh, really talking about uh, kind of GME optimization and, and I guess specifically spam fighting. And um, what I find interesting is how whenever I talk to you know someone who uh, has a very successful agency and focuses a lot on local, spam fighting is a key action that they undertake. We recently surveyed a lot of our kind of broader kind of customer base, and only a small fraction actually offer uh, and actively do spam fighting. Um, and we're trying to kind of educate people actually. You know what this. Yes, it can be quite difficult and tricky to get right to do it, but it does have a massive impact. So, you know, having people like you say that anything that beat links is spam, hopefully that will drive the message home to, you know, other SEOs looking that that is a service that they absolutely should be offering uh, to their kind of customers. Um, okay. Yeah, there are some markets you can't win without fighting spam. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Okay, let's jump in and actually uh, pick up some other questions now. I'm going to open up the, uh, the kind of question module. Uh, please do upvote things. Um, so we had one of the six upvotes. Great, this has been asked uh, by uh, Marcus. Uh, it's just jumped around in front of me. Uh, when it comes to local, what's the best way to build links? Is it just submitting your business to local directories? Does that have a value, I guess? Uh, and what are the other ways um, that you can potentially kind of prioritize them in, in numerical order? And I guess maybe, obviously, we've talked about some of the sources and how you find those. Maybe we can go a little bit sort of deeper into other alternative sources, but also maybe if we could talk a bit like, about some of the tactics that you use to actually engage sites. So once you've identified a site or a source of potential link, you know, what's in your armory in terms of you know, how you might approach them uh, and you know, what you might offer them or dangle in front of them to get them to uh, want to give a link back to your client? Yeah, that's great. Uh, so I think from a 30,000 foot view, the easier it is for you to get a link, the easier it is for everybody to get a link. And so the less value that link's likely to have. Um, overall directories, I think they're table stakes. They're important. You've got to be able to provide that data to Google. Google wants to see consistent data across those major providers. Um, vertical specific directories, so legal directories, more valuable than just general business directories. Yeah, local business directories, more valuable than general business directories. But I really view directories as kind of just like table stake stuff. Everybody should be doing that, but you can't rely on that to make the difference. Um, and the next step from that is, is like, you can start with the I, this content marketing idea and say, hey, I'm gonna come up with content on my site that I'm gonna attract links naturally. And so I would be publishing very local, uh, in the legal context, you see things like these um, dangerous intersection maps, or you know, you want to think about what's relevant to people on a local level that's somewhat related to the business that you do. So, um, coming up with creative content ideas really does attract local links because local community sites want to talk about those local issues. Um, that's one way to do it from a content marketing perspective. But from the old school kind of like hammer it out. It's going and figuring out what the uh, site might want from you. So do they have a place on their site where they post scholarships or something? Or, um, you know, I know scholarships is still a thing. I know it's been abused and people try to do the like, oh, we're going to host a scholarship and get a .edu link. But instead of doing that, maybe do like a very localized scholarship for somebody in your community. And again, that's going to attract a lot more attention from local news sites. Uh, from local schools, um, local organizations, 
those types of activities can really draw attention in your local community and then grow local links. But in terms of prospecting, I'm topical relevance and geographic relevance. Work your way through that list. Uh, I think if I had to pick between topical and local, I'd go local. Um, we don't really focus on domain authority. We don't really focus on whether it's followed or no followed. Um, I want links that are on local sites in my community, local news sites, local schools, youth sports organizations, like that kind of stuff. Those real organizations from real sites that are really local tend to move the dial the most. Do you find it easier to um, strike up, I guess, a relationship and get a link back from, let's say, a non-commercial organization as opposed to another business? Could you ask that again? Do, sorry. Do you find it easier to um, strike up a relationship and essentially kind of get, let's say, goodwill uh, sort of links back from uh, an organization that's non-commercial, let's say a sports organization or a school or a library versus another business that is commercially orientated? Um, not always. I, you know, sometimes it's vice versa. Sometimes these, uh, you know, local news sites or uh, local organizations have like very strict no link policies. And so the best you're going to get there is a citation or a mention, um, which, again, I think is good, too. I, I would don't get so hung up on like, did they actually get the link and the anchor text right? Like you'd rather them just writing about you and mentioning you and talking about you and nurturing that relationship mm -hmm. than just not considering them because they have a link, some link policy. Um, but you know, on local and for small businesses, the biggest obstacle is often the technical aspects of actually getting someone to add a link to the site. It's like, who's the website admin? The business owner doesn't know. They don't know how to log in. They call the web developer. Uh, and so sometimes it's just really a lot of handholding to like, there's willingness to, to add the link. There's just technical obstacles to be able to get the link actually, uh, posted. Yeah, I totally understand. So how, um, I guess in a tip for a typical client, how much, how much kind of time is, you know, I, I presume as an agency, you, you, you sell on time. I'll make that assumption. Maybe you don't, but you can qualify that for me. How much of your time and resource do you think is, is kind of spent on targeting relationship building with the hope of getting a link? Yeah, it varies. Um, you know, when we do, we start with an audit and say, okay, let's look at your site. Let's look at the technical issues with your site. Let's look at your backlink profile. Let's look at competitors' backlink profile. Let's start to uh, model out what we think it's going to take for you to start cracking into some of these more competitive results. And then we build a uh, essentially a monthly proposal that's built on that. And so if you've got, if you have no links, that's going to be a big part of it. You know, I'm going to make some numbers up. Maybe it's 80%. Uh, link building, 20% something else, tech, some technical stuff, maybe some content. Um, if you've got a great link profile and you don't have as much um, technical success, maybe we spend more time on that. So it's, it's really hard to quantify that in terms of the amount of time we spend. You know, people always ask too, like, how many links do we need? And it's like, enough to rank number one, right? So um, there's not really a formula. That's another thing too. In local particularly, it doesn't necessarily take a ton of links. A couple really good local links can make a big difference. You know, people are focused on like, I want to, I got a, I got 200 linking root domains over here. I need 200 linking root domains. That's not necessarily true uh, if your local topically relevant links are beat, going against like a 200 linking root domains from sites like Forbes and other major publisher sites. This just it's in locals, it's not apples to apples. How do you manage it when, let's say, you've got an, a, a, um, a, a legal firm you work with that's got multiple disciplines? Like they might do, uh, you know, kind of criminal law, they might do, you know, kind of DUA, or um, and let's say that they're, they're, they're popular in one area and they're ranking well, but the other the other services are either new or unpopular. Do you adapt your your link strategy to enable uh, you know them to rank for other services? Uh, we could spend the whole rest of the time talking about this. So um, the brief version is that for legal specifically, you really need to pick what your primary practice area is going to be, uh, at least by location. So it's going to be very difficult for you to get your primary office location to rank for all the major competitor terms across categories. And that makes sense because if you 
you've only got so many categories you can list. There's only so many different sources uh, for links and it just, you start to dilute yourself if you try to do it to everybody. So you're competing with sites that are just focused on DUI and you're doing DUI, personal injury, bankruptcy. It's gonna be hard to compete with them. Now, what you can do is you can use practitioner listings and practitioner pages uh, to try to rank for those other categories, or you can open a different location. But you know, Google's world doesn't always match the real world. And so if you're a firm that does a bunch of different practice areas, in a single location, you got to get creative about how you're going to be able to try to build visibility for those other uh, practice areas. At least that's been our experience. Most of the time, I say, if you're ranking well for your primary practice area, focus on localized traditional results. Uh, but trying to build uh, visibility in local packs, I would say probably not worth jeopardizing if you're doing great in your primary practice area. So from a, uh, a kind of local pack perspective uh, and a kind of you know local final results, your primary category, that's what you're aiming for. But if you want to rank for additional categories, don't so much think of it from a, from a ranking in the pack perspective. Think of it and how we can get rankings in the organic results underneath the pack for those additional services and focus on that. Um, yeah, okay. or, or use practitioner pages. If you want to try to have multiple practice areas in a local pack, you can try to use a practitioner page with a different category um, and you know same thing you would do for your primary office location but we've seen that that can work um, but trying to get the same office location to rank for four five six different legal practice areas really really tough on the topic of sort of practitioners and that's obviously extends out to medical and other industries that have that same um, you know kind of clinic practitioner agency practitioner sort of model um, do you, um, do you, when you're kind of doing kind of outreach in the community and building relationships, do you always focus it from uh, you know the, the practice perspective, or will you sometimes also work on behalf of specific practitioners um, if sanctioned by uh, the you know um, the sort of centralized body that they work for? That's a great question too, and I think that um, if you're advising clients, uh, it's really important to have this conversation because. If the practitioner is not a firm partner, doesn't have a ownership interest in the law firm, and you build up their presence in local in a practitioner page, uh, you might they might argue that that's their property, that their intellectual property. And so you, know, you should be thinking about advising clients about that. You know, what happens if the lawyer that's not a partner leaves? Do they take that uh, presence with them? Uh, do they ask you to close it and shut it down? So those are good conversations for us. We typically work with the business owners. So it's a firm partner uh, and we're building up the presence of the office locations of the firm, as well as most of the managing partners. Uh, if it's a, an associate, like the, the firm will have to make a decision about whether or not would they want us to invest time building up that associate's visibility but a very very important question to ask mm. yes i can definitely see how that can um uh can create problems down the road if you haven't established up front exactly how you how you want to approach that okay uh let's uh pick another question um we've dealt with that top one next question is um uh can you provide some examples of spam links um i think there may be uh, some confusion here so i'll let you maybe kind of clarify that so can you provide some examples of spam links uh, and you know, do you use any particular tools uh, to identify them? So someone has, someone's, I think when we talked about spam and links a second, I think we might have kind of created uh, some confusion there. Um, do you want to maybe differentiate for the audience what you meant by spam uh, when you mentioned it a second ago? Sure, so when I was talking about spam, I was really talking about your typical GMB spam, like spamming the business name field with keywords or completely fake listings. I see Jason's on here, so I'll let him field those questions. Um, but there are spam links too, right? So uh, obvious paid links, that's a problem. Um, there are other, there are all sorts of other types of spam that we could talk about from links as well, but in the context we we're talking about earlier, I was really talking about GMB spam versus link spam. Uh, and most link spam now, I think, unless it triggers a unnatural link warning, manual action, uh, I think Google's really just dialed those signals back versus algorithmically penalizing you for spammy links. But it's more about just don't waste your time and effort trying to go after links that are low value. And if you focus on local links, 
you focus on local links from real topically relevant sites, you're not going to run into that problem. It's like when you're running and you're going out and being like, I want to buy uh, domain authority, 80 links from this random publisher site that's part of a private blog network. Those are more of the problematic spam links that you run into. But for local, honestly, those don't work as well anyway. Okay. Uh, George has asked a follow on question in the chat. Is how important are social channels for building links? So I love this question too. We get it all the time. And if the question is, does social, do links from social count? Uh, my opinion, they don't do anything. Um, but using social to get your site in front of people who can link to your site is really, really valuable. So the almost obvious example is Twitter and journalists, uh, but joining Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups, uh, people who have common interests and who are locally organized, uh, meetups, stuff like that, those social, that's a great way to get links, to use social media to get links. Yeah, so they use it as an outreach tool, essentially, uh, to kind of get, get in front of the relevant people. Uh, you mentioned meetups there, actually. Uh, do you kind of, you know, do you, you see much sort of value in, I guess, it's about building local communities. So in terms of organizing events, uh, kind of meetups, either larger scale uh, sort of events, is that a tactic you, you see uh, much joy from? Love events, um, whether it's uh, an educational event, putting on a seminar, um, you know, we've had experiences where people will actually, businesses will register as the uh, local child safety seat installation center, and they'll put on seminars about educating people about putting safety seats in their vehicles. And those get picked up by local fire departments, local police stations, local state police, mm -hmm. and you get listed on this great site uh, as a official child safety center or child safety seat installation site. And so those are really powerful ways to get links, especially at the local level. Um, obviously, I'm going to say this and everybody's going to go, oh, I'm going to go register as a uh, child safety seat center uh, installation place. There are other issues. There's insurance questions and all this kind of stuff that you got to deal with. But um, the point is that events, really, really powerful for local link building. And how, how, I guess in the current, current circumstances of COVID-19, um, and obviously there's an outpouring of support for frontline workers and key workers and obviously people doing things to help their community. Um, have you come across any new new initiatives or new opportunities that you know businesses now who are looking to still invest in in their kind of search marketing uh, could be considering from either a kind of community building or an outreach for link per sort of point of view? Yeah, I don't think it's, in my view, it's not new, but it's a great opportunity to, uh, one, just help those folks who are truly heroes that are out there every day, putting their lives and families at risk uh, to help people. Um, and two, it's a great way to be a leader in your community. And just whether it's just um, sponsoring lunch for somebody or sending pizzas or uh, organizing something on behalf of uh, healthcare workers, it's a great opportunity to do that. It's great PR. It's good for link building. Yeah, and people are looking for leadership now. You know, they're looking for leadership at every at every level, community right up to the right up to the top. Um, so yes, I imagine this actually interestingly creates a lot of new opportunities to genuinely be a supportive business within your kind of local community uh, and get some of the kind of benefits that will help your marketing off the back of it. Uh, okay, we've got the questions flooding in now. Thank you, everyone. We'll uh, we'll kind of jump on to uh, the next uh, the next bit question. Um, question. This one coming from uh, Luke Hancock. It says, as someone that manages digital for a franchise network, um, how can I evangelize local link building uh, with the franchise network? Feels like my words fall on deaf ears. Um, and a kind of follow-on question is, you know, are there any kind of low-hanging fruit? For local link opportunities that he should make use of and i guess it could be at an individual uh, location level or at a sort of franchise level yeah this is tough we see this insurance a lot um getting the buy-in is so tough from corporate uh i often say just go work with the local franchise folks and see if you can either get them to support some local op opportunities a lot of times the franchisees can't really do anything because they're locked into the rules of their uh, franchise agreement um but usually if you can get a couple of the franchisees to buy in and demonstrate the power of ranking in the local pack and local links in the local pack 
people start to be like, hmm, maybe we should be investing more in that. But I, that's a very common issue. I don't have a great magic bullet there. Uh, it's it's going to be franchised e by franchisee. It's going to depend on the franchise relationship. But I find there's more success going directly to the franchisees than trying to work with corporate. Like I, in my experience, they're very like, meh. Yeah. So I guess the proof is in the pudding there to some degree, isn't it? If you can establish and prove value for one franchisee and then communicate that you know, out to the other franchisees, they're more likely to kind of buy in having seen that, you know, one has had success uh, in that area. Yeah, or show them what competition's doing. If you've got competitors who are beating them and you can demonstrate that links are at least part of that conversation, then nothing better than going to leadership and saying, hey, this is the comp This is why the competition's beating you in the local pack. Yeah, true. Um, do you, um, what's the biggest, I guess, um, sort of network you work with in terms of locations? You said you got some national clients. How many locations would they have typically? Tens. So um, okay. we don't have anybody with over 100 locations, um, but most I would say are in the, uh, the multi locations are between, you know, eight and maybe 20. OK, so scalability uh, is pretty straightforward at, the, at, at that level then. Yeah, but I guess once. You yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's hard even at that level. Um, for for the big, bigger multi locations, like yeah, you, the thing is, is like you gotta just think about the competitive environment. So if you can be the big bully in the area uh, and you can leverage some of that uh, large size. So obviously, if you've got a single site with a hundred different locations, you're gonna benefit from that uh, authority of that site. Uh, versus having a hundred different sites. So that's one idea is to consolidate. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, if you're competing with local businesses that are dedicated to local SEO and they're the only, they only have to market one business um, and they're making the commitment to it, those can be really tough to dislodge. Yeah, I kind of equate it kind of, kind of like guerrilla warfare. You know, you've got someone who knows their local environment so well that they can just focus all the energies and attention on that rather than you know have their minds and activities pulled uh, across a wider area. Uh, okay, great. Uh, get, let's go to uh, the next question. Um, uh, what are your What are your strategies to use to persuade third party businesses to link to your client? I mean, maybe can you give three of the things that you think work best when you're trying to convince or um, someone to link to you? What are the, the most effective um, things that you can, carrots that you can dangle in front of them? Uh, great question. So broken links are the easiest, in my opinion, because if a site is actually being maintained and they're linking to something that no longer exists or is just like factually wrong, you can just go in and say, hey, I noticed you looked to this as a resource, it's wrong, or it needs, it's not working anymore. We've reproduced this or may improved upon it over here. If you're willing to update your link, be, I think it'd be great for people that you're trying to get that information to. And they'll do that. And we've even seen that happen even with like state government sites. So the state government's been linking to something for forever and it's just not there anymore or it's broken or it's um, just wrong. Uh, they'll be, it, you know, it takes a lot of handholding to get to the right people to actually update it. But once you do, that can be a really valuable link. So broken link building is really powerful. Um, you know, money always talks. So if you can, if you're going to, if it's a sponsorship or some kind of joint partnership, you know, we get into this question of like, was well, that link buying? And it's like, well, if your primary purpose is going out and being like, hey, I will quid pro quo give you money for a link on your site, then yeah, I think you probably got some problems. Um, but if you're talking about sponsorship, if it's a cause you're passionate about anyway, uh, and you're do, you're providing some content, providing some value, and part of that is an administrative fee to actually execute the page update with a link. I think that that works really well too. Um, scholarships still work. Local scholarships, you know, I really think focusing on things in the local area, like any content that's localized, and just going out and saying, hey, that's, if it's newsworthy content that your community is going to care about. They, they, those do better. Uh, the scale stuff doesn't work as well. So if you're you know, trying to pull a list of 10,000 sites and just hammering everybody with outreach emails, it's going to be really inefficient. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It still can. You know, I always think of link building like sales, like outbound sales can still work, just not as efficient as in, inbound potentially. Um, so you got to do a lot of numbers to get the same number of links 
than if you just focus on something really personalized, really local, li- really well researched. Um, you're gonna have a higher conversion rate from uh, pitch to link. Mm. I mean, do you ever? I mean, maybe you don't do it now. I mean, do you that kind of mass sort of link outreach? Um, does it ever work? You know, what, what, yes. do you, what do you? It does. And what do you? What do you think is the sort of um, for every hundred people you contact? You know, what's your ROI on that in terms of number of number of links or or even communication back? That's hard because what's ROI, right? Uh, so if you wanted straight analysis of like dollars spent on time on outreach versus uh, number of links or impact of those number of links on your mm. bottom line, that's really hard to connect, right? Like it's hard to connect the links to bottom line in general. This is like a classic problem we get into when we talk about SEO is, is like, well, uh, what's my forecasted improvement on revenue based on your efforts? And it's like, well, we can track conversion. We can track qualified lead growth. We can track organic traffic and targeted organic traffic in your area. Uh, we can correlate that to the link activities and the content activities we've done. But it's really, really tough to say this link made you X plus Y dollars. Um, mm, yeah, it's less efficient. I mean, the more personalized and the more quality of the efforts, and I say that it's like, it seems general, um, but if you're just hammering people with like, Hey, I read your uh, blog and it's a great blog. And I was wondering, I have a blog over here and I was wondering if you'd link to my blog, that's not going to work most of the time. And we still see, I mean, I get those emails 50 times a day. Um, But the ones that are actually like well-researched, like, hey, I actually did read what you wrote here and you actually have something substantively valuable to add to it, you get a lot better response. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay, uh, the questions are coming thick and fast, so let's jump over to uh, another question. Um, Where are you up to? Uh, Keep going. I can grab my charger. Okay, sure thing. Okay, this one comes in from uh, from John Sable. It says, uh, a, a, lo- a lawyer client wants to attract leads from more affluent towns outside of their office's zip code. Um, can link building specifically help with this challenge? With lead tracking? Uh, it's from leads from outside the area. So they're in one zip code, but maybe there's a big city nearby where actually there's more affluent uh, kind of clients there or a bigger uh, sort of population pool. Can link building help them to you know, ultimately rank uh, outside of their local area and therefore attract uh, and generate leads from you know, either this bigger population pool or from you know, more affluent towns? So it's kind of linked related to that question of like ranking outside your area, being visible outside your area and, and attracting customers from an area that you're not physically located in. It can for traditional localized results. So non pack localized results for sure. Local pack without a physical presence, it's really, really hard. Um, You know, Google has really turned up the proximity signal. I mean, I walk in downtown Chicago and get different results as I go from block to block. Um, And so it depends on where you are. If you're in a less um, populated area, then yeah, you can. I think that authority you can build up and you'll start to show uh, in a larger geographic area. But proximity really, really matters for local pack results. So I, I wouldn't say go build links to try to rank in a different uh, area in the local pack. I just say go open up a new uh, location. Okay. Um, and does that work in the legal industry, given that, you know, they presumably they have to have a, a nice swanky office to, uh, to entertain their, their would-be clients in? Yeah, we don't need what nice swanky offices uh, if you're ranking a local pack. Because remember, if you get, so they'll just use Chicago as an example. So primary swanky office is downtown. Uh, We open up an office in a suburban area, but we tell clients like, hey, you can come to the suburban office, but if you want to come to the nice swanky office downtown, you can do that too. So uh, it kind of depends on the nature of the work and who your target audience is and all that kind of stuff. But you know, I mean, if we see this all, I mean, lawyers in the U.S., one of their most popular things to do is to try to do some kind of like a co-lease situation with a, either a different lawyer or a different professional service provider. Uh, and that location can rank. And uh, it's more valuable to them to be able to do that than it is to, you know, build out some kind of like 
formidable office uh, in a different location. But I know, you know, it depends on your resources. I know lawyers that do that too. I mean, I know lawyers that are building tens, uh, twenties, really nice office locations throughout the state uh, because they serve the state and it has value to them. Yeah, and I guess to go back to that specific question, if you know, if if it's really important to you to attract clients from this one more affluent area, then you know maybe relocate to that area uh, or create exactly. a second office. It makes a lot. It makes a lot of sense. It's um, funny because you know having done this over the last eleven or so years, it hasn't until more recently really been like a consideration. But now, when you're opening a business or opening a new office location, like lo local SEO diligence should be a part of that decision making process. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. It's going to be you know, a, a huge factor. Uh, okay, let me jump over, pick up the next question. Um, uh, in your link building process, there's a question from Jack. Thank you, Jack. He's got a couple of questions, actually. Um, in your link building process, how much do you handle as the agency uh, and how much does the client handle? Uh, and I guess how might that vary depending on the nature of the relationship or the, I guess, the commercial relationship you've got with them? I'm sorry, I got a little distracted by the comments there. Let me clarify <laughs> something first. So um, I'm not going to get into debate about the guidelines. I will tell you this. If you have a bona fide lease that is staffed with your people uh, at a location, uh, you have signage, you have your own phone number. Um, I can tell you that most of the time that's not problematic. It might get in, you might get into issues if you don't have signage, if you don't have it staffed, um, if you're not answering the phone or you're sharing a phone line or you're working with a, you're in a office that is a same practitioner as you. So I wouldn't tell you to go try to open the same office location with another, if you're a personal injury lawyer or another personal injury lawyer. I certainly wouldn't tell you to go open a uh, Regis office or a virtual office or a PO box or anything like that. Um, but I think Google's got a hard time to uh, tell people like, hey, it's against the guidelines to go actually sublease from a space. But context matters. It depends on the situation. Um, I, but I can tell you that uh, opening, getting a lease from somebody else that's a different business, uh, as long as you're staffing it, as long as it's an actual bona fide office, it usually passes muster. Well, it's, it's legitimate, isn't it? You know, you, you're, you're actually got a functioning office there. And that's all that Google is really looking for. You know, what it's looking for is, is to sort of stamp out scenarios that someone is pretending to have a functioning office purely for the sake of ranking in a kind of local area. So if you can tick all those those kind of genuineness boxes, um, then absolutely you're playing by you're playing by the kind of guidelines, and you know Google should have no yeah. issue. Um, you know, Jason uh, Jason may disagree. We'll have to see what he says in this. Yeah, second. run it by Jason. You can yeah. see. Um, let's not to look at the chat for a while. Let's let Jason. Let's let uh, let's let that debate sort of you know thrash itself out on the right hand side. Uh, okay, next question, uh, go back to Jack's question. So in, in your link building process, uh, how much work do you as the agency do versus what the client does? Uh, that varies. Uh, some of our clients really want nothing to do with anything. They wanna basically be uh, the approval and that's it. Um, other clients are really, really involved. And I'll tell you that the ones who are more involved the more successful it is. Uh, it's really hard for a, an agency to, uh, it's harder for an agency to build links without the participation of the client in, at some level. Um, at the very least, I would say there should be some kind of arrangement made so that uh, both from a optics point of view and a legal point of view that you can actually uh, represent that you work with the business. So it's really hard for uh, us to go out and say, Hey, I'm a guy at attorney sink and I'm building links for this law firm. It's never going to work. Um, on the other hand, if you say, if it's like, Hey, I'm reaching out on behalf of this law firm, um, or I'm, I'm working with this law firm or I'm marketing, uh, representative for this law firm. Um, and you have an email from the law firm or your email from the business, you're going to have a lot more success. Uh, if you can get the lawyer to send the email, that's going to be the best result most of the time, but it's hard. It varies all over the map, and it, you know it depends. These small businesses—they're all different. Uh, they run them differently. They want the owners want different involvement. They've got different roles and functions, and so as an agency advising them, you really got to take all that information in, make the best recommendations you can. But you got to take in consideration that this isn't a uh, this isn't like building SaaS software here. Like 
We're not just like scale it up and uh, you're going to get results. It just doesn't work that way. These businesses are much, much different. They're not standardized like a lot of bigger businesses are. Um, and that can be a competitive advantage in some cases. Okay. And is, I mean, did you always sort of set out, is you, is you, when you're working with a new client, for example, um, do you always kind of educate them as much as possible that having them more involved is going to get great results and the best results? Or do you tend to start with understanding their business first and then coming up with a solution that you think is going to suit them? That's a great question. Um, we listen first. Uh, tell us about your firm. Tell us about your past marketing practices. Tell us about who's working at the firm. Tell us about your goals. Um, I think that's really, really important to do to start, but we certainly nudge. I mean, we're advisors. And so when that when those questions come up, we say, you know, look, if here's an example of how of what we can do with your participation, and here's what that looks like without your participation. And a lot of times the lawyers realize it and they're like, yeah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Uh, I'd be more receptive to that kind of campaign myself. Um, but, you know, we can't substitute video of lawyers like it's got to be the lawyer. So if we're going to do video content, it's got to be the lawyer. Um, we can work with lawyers on written content, but ultimately, especially if it's got uh, substantive legal stuff in it, like we want that lawyer to make sure that they are signed off that's going to be published on behalf of their firm. Um, mm. And so the more participation, the better. And they, most of them get it. And where they don't, um, you know, there's things you can do. They just tend to be a little bit harder to get traction than the ones where they participate. Great answer, Guy. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, let's go. Uh, next question down. Um, um, a follow-up question from the same chap, Jack. Um, what are your favorite tools uh, that you use specifically for link building, link analysis, link identification? Uh, maybe give the, uh, the top two or three uh, that you tend to focus most of your usage with. Yeah, I mean, I use most of the majors. I mean, Ahrefs, um, we still do Majestic, Moz. Um, you know, we take your rank tracking tool and go and look at, identify those local competitors, see who's got the share of voice leader is for where you want to rank and go do competitive backlink analysis and intersect analysis. Uh, you know, don't just try to copy backlink profiles because a lot of your competition probably have links that either aren't doing anything or might actually potentially be raising problems for them. Um, but where you see patterns of, you know, you see all of the major competitors have uh, directory listings from these directories, go get that, prioritize that directory. Uh, do you see that, that scholarship links are working for this competitor? Think about ways that you can do scholarships. So um, I think the rank tracking tool, Google Maps, um, and obviously all the link indices are really, really great ways to start prospecting. But I'm kind of old school too. I mean, we do uh, the old fashioned just search operators. Um, that's a great way for to do link prospecting. Um, but, you know, think local. I mean, a lot of it, I think we get too caught up as marketers into like all the fancy stuff we can do. Uh, just go walk around your neighborhood if you're in a smaller community and look for businesses that might be topically relevant to you uh, and go check out their sites. And if their sites have things on them like um, sponsorship opportunities or events and things like that that you might be able to get involved with, go find ways to get involved there and you're gonna find that you're gonna get earned links back. Okay, great, Keith, thank you. Uh, so look, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I reckon we're gonna overrun by a few minutes. Guy, would you be able to sort of hang on for an additional 10 minutes? Sure. Yeah, we'll just make sure we get through all the questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, hopefully that was useful uh, for you, Jack. Um, this question comes in from uh, Christian. It says, um, what are the local link building tactics besides responding to Harrow queries and starting scholarships do you recommend for home service businesses? Um, now, obviously, you, you kind of, you've always sort of focused on the kind of legal sector. This is a bit around home services businesses. Do you see there being any difference in the approach taken or why getting uh, links for home services would be more challenging than, you know, physical businesses? Yeah, so um, my business partner actually uh, worked in home services many, many years ago. I have to admit, though, it's not my area of expertise. Um, and so maybe there are some unique things to uh, home services that I'm going to miss here. But the concept still remains the same. Think local, think about your service area, who's in your service area, what do they care about? 
And what are the things that might be intersect between your local area and what you do? And get creative. It doesn't have to be exactly like content that's about home services. It might be something that's relating to like, I don't know, I'm just gonna make something up here. But um, you know, if you're in an area that's like prone to tornadoes or something, you might create some content that relates to uh, your that area and the impact of tornadoes on people's houses or something. But the point is, is to try to find topically similar things that your audience is dealing with that you can create content around that people are going to be interested in. You know, maybe you maybe you give away a service. You have a contest where you like give away services for something that generates buzzes in your local community and uh, people want to talk about it. Maybe the local news will cover it. So the same type of idea still applies in my opinion. Um, maybe there are specific things that are unique to home services that are slightly different. Um, but I'll tell you what, you think it's hard to build content for home services, try doing it for like bankruptcy law. Uh, so everybody's got uh, challenges with the, some of these types of businesses. Um, but I think the more local we think, the more we think about uh, the places that we're trying to earn links from and what they want to publish, the better you're going to do. How important or how valuable a resource is, is the client knowledge um, when you're trying to identify like tangential content opportunities? Because um, I guess when you're talking about your bankruptcy law, you may be thinking, you know, maybe you don't know that much about it. Maybe you think it's quite a dry topic and therefore you know, not that much around it. But I guess maybe you could actually mine the knowledge of the, of the client to really understand actually there are lots of related topics here. Um, is that an important part of what you do? And are there any good kind of template questions that you use that really tease out that information? Yeah, that's a great question. I think generally, yes, it's very helpful if the client has existing resources. So we always tell our clients like, hey, if you publish something or if you're reading a book or you buy a treatise or something in legal, like let us know uh, because that might be something that we might invest in also to be able to help us with um, knowledge and um, content development, that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you what, the other side of the coin is, is that sometimes the expert goes so deep on their expertise, they can't zoom out and come up with creative content ideas to be able that people actually link to. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, if you put me to task, I'd rather have the creative marketing mind than the subject matter expertise mind from a link building standpoint, uh, because it's really, really, really hard to publish the best expertise on something and get people to link to it than it is to come up with like a creative, clever or funny or entertaining uh, topically relevant post. And that takes a lot more creativity than to take subject matter expertise. Why is that? Could you maybe elaborate on, on why you see it that way? I think it's just the way the web works. I mean, I think, um, you know, think about who's doing, you know, you want a link from uh, the CDC. It's like, yeah, you need some serious expertise on your site. So you better be an epidemiologist with like a lot of background. Uh, that's the only way someone's going to link to that. Um, on the alternative, if you're looking to try to get like local links in your community, like local bloggers and local news sites, they are uh, incentivized to link to and share stuff that they think is entertaining for their audience or educational for their audience. Um, and so it's just a lot harder to, to be the person who does the thing, especially in a competitive environment. Uh, than it is to come up with some creative things, at least from a link building standpoint. I mean, at the end of the day, you should be doing both. You, yeah, you should be pub mm -hmm. publishing expertise. Uh, that's going to help to position you and distinguish you because you still got to make the sale. Um, but from a link building standpoint, humor, entertainment, new being first matters a lot. Um, and not that expertise isn't important, it just happens to be easier to do it for a link building standpoint with some of those other ways. Yeah, that's great insight, actually, uh, in terms of how building that kind of deep, high authority kind of content um, may be overwhelming for the for local publishers to kind of share, because actually it's just far too detailed and far too in-depth. But it does actually help to sort of establish kind of credibility and authority on your site when people get there. You want to know, does this person really, truly understand this topic and are they an expert? Uh, but maybe they're kind of creative. And that kind of, the idea about being first in something, being really kind of creative and kind of unique as well as genuine, 
is likely to kind of tick the boxes that you know people who are looking to share your content uh, will be looking uh, looking for in the content that you've got. Uh, okay, I think that's another uh, thing. To, sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's a good point. Um, and it's kind of nuanced, but from a content standpoint, your content should have an objective, right? Is this content for an audience that's going to try to attract uh, new business for you or convert business for you? Uh, is it uh, link building content? Is it a combination of both? But being more objective focused, you might strategically design content much differently from a link building standpoint than you would if you're trying to attract someone in, that's in your target audience to actually hire you. Okay. Um, we'll kind of come back to that if you have a little more time. I've got a couple of follow-on questions. So I'll make sure that we address all the questions that have uh, been asked. Um, uh, I'm just going through. We've done that question in a second. Uh, this comment comes from uh, um, Lauren. We use call tracking numbers on the site to track our leads, uh, but generally use a destination number on local directories. So this is, I guess, not necessarily link related. Um, is that best practice in terms of using tracking numbers on additional on um, uh, on the kind of core site, but general numbers on directories? Um, how do you see that and how do you kind of manage that when you're, I guess it's more about citation building. Uh, rather That's than fine. We can, I can, I'll tell you what I do. Uh, okay, great. My current view is this dynamic number insertion uh, on the site. So we use call rail. We love call rail. Um, and we use a dedicated call tracking number as the alternative, or I'm sorry, dedicated call tracking number as the primary number on GMB and the real local number as the alternative. And we haven't run into issues. Now, we certainly aren't adding different call tracking numbers throughout the local ecosystem. So we're not, you know, Yelp a tracking number and Yellow Pages a tracking number and Legal Directory a tracking number. Um, but those basics usually cover most of it. I mean, uh, I guess it depends on different verticals. But uh, in legal, like it's our website, it's our um, GMB listing and maybe some primary directories, but a lot of the directories offer ways to do tracking uh, that doesn't mess up the ecosystem and still allows you to do some basic tracking, so. And, so, and can you tell what we said at the start in terms of what you use in your own site then with Cool Rail? Um, you said you used, uh, you know, kind of rotating numbers? Yeah, they do the keyword pool. So it basically generates a number and uh, that way you can get the, that's the most granular way to get the source data. Um, so if you've got ad campaigns running, you can get very, very granular information about calls. Um, go call real. I think there, it was posted in the comments, but, um, mm. call has got a lot of great documentation on this and we've been really pleased with, um, using call real. And you mainly, are those numbers triggered by the source of the traffic based on some sort of UTM parameter? It's actually based on the session. So uh, it just, it, you, based, based on the uh, number of, the amount of traffic that your site's getting, CallRail will say, well, you're gonna need about this many numbers in your pool. And then the software automatically fires off a unique number uh, from the pool by session. But what that allows you to do is what you're alluding to is you can track source, medium, landing page, keyword, uh, all sorts of great uh, call data to be able to get inform your campaigns. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Um, okay, uh, go back into the question pool. Uh, da, da, da. Do press releases help with building backlinks? Question from Terry. Only if they're newsworthy. You know, so the traditional like PR web, just like hammer the web with like, hey, we are added a new employee at the company. Not, don't even bother in my opinion. But if you actually have a newsworthy story and you want to get some buzz around that, like, yeah, press release can be great if it actually gets picked up because it's actually newsworthy. Really, really powerful. I mean, hopefully I don't have to tell folks that, uh, especially from a local context, like local news links, really, really great. Great for awareness for your company. Uh, great for expertise and authority. Uh, great from a link building standpoint. Build those relationships with those local journalists. So you don't use it as standard practice. You just use it as and when you think you've got something that, you know, genuinely might be of interest to uh, journalists. Yeah, I mean, standard practice. I, I probably not as a standard practice. Um, but it's like every time we post something or something that's like news-ish content, we're not just like automatically submitting it to like PR web or something like that. 
Um, but we definitely think of PR for any kind of campaign. I mean, link building is PR. It's digital PR for uh, in this context of it. And so um, where you can get that in front of journalists who can cover it and actually link to it, like, yeah, you definitely want to do that. Okay, great. Thanks, Key. Uh, and is PR Web the one you, you, you tend to use? Uh, no, don't quote me on that. Uh, we've used a bunch of different services. Do you find they're all pretty similar in terms of their ability to reach you know, journalists? Um, there's some variance, and it depends on how much money you spend, what package you get. Uh, but I, honestly, like, if you're a very local business and you want to do local link building, go identify who the local newspapers are or the local um, outposts for a major publication and find the journalists who are covering your area uh, and start to build a relationship with them. You know, start following what they're doing on Twitter. Um, start to get creative about ways that you're, you know, look at the stories that they like to cover. If they have special instances, excuse me, special interest stories that they tend to prefer to cover, start to think of ways that you can provide them with that material. I mean, journalists need stories to cover. That's what keeps them going. And so uh, you got to have a story. And so coming up with a story that they actually care about, that's the hard part. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. We're getting a good way down the list now. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, do you consider link building uh, the task of an SEO specialist? Um, you know, or do you think it's something that, uh, you know, do you have a specific people who focus on link building? Uh, is it part of everyone's job? You know, how do you manage it within your agency? So for us, uh, our strategist role definitely needs to have link building chops. Um, but from a just philosophical standpoint, you know, there are all sorts of specialty disciplines within SEO, right? So you can be a great technical, excuse me, I don't know why I'm having such a hard time talking. Um, you can be a great technical SEO and never touch link building in your entire life and provide tremendous value to sites. You can be a content person that's really focused on delivering great content and optimizing the on-page stuff with respect to content, uh, never touch link building. Um, or you can be, you know, the quote unquote T-shaped marketer and go deep on links and know a little bit across the board. But uh, to me in, in the local context, everything else is kind of table stakes. I mean, you got to get site architecture right. You got to get your internal link structure right. Uh, you want to have content on your site that uh, is valuable. But I'll tell you, I see sites all the time that you look at the content and be like, this is horrible. I can't believe this is ranking. And then you wonder why it's ranking. And it's either spam or it's good backlinks. OK. Uh, all right, I think I have one one final question, uh, Guy, and then uh, we'll wrap this up. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, da -da uh, where do we go? Where do we go? Um, okay, this is I guess it's got an agency related question. This one comes from Joe Goodman. Um, I guess it is, his question is: How would you recommend to scale this up for larger agencies? Um, you know, is it more of a, a higher, more people circumstance? Um, or is it, is, I guess, is it a process that you want to hone the process so that actually it doesn't become just a, a more people, more numbers to get it done? Um, how do you think about the, I guess, the kind of act of scaling both within your agency uh, and maybe in general as a process, you know, across you know, multiple locations or franchise business? Yeah, sadly, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I just I have a really hard time seeing how you maintain the effectiveness and efficiency and still scaling. For sure, process matters, um, and having great people with creative ideas matters a lot. Um, and you should learn from what's working. You know, test all your stuff. You know, we take tactics that uh, from a content and link building standpoint that worked over here, and then we take them and apply them over here, and it works again. Great. Um, but when I think of scale and I think of really like growing things where you're uh, getting much bigger, like 10x, 20x outputs from the same input, it's really, really hard in this context. I just, I haven't been able to figure it out. I don't know if anybody really has. Um, it's art and science. I mean, a lot of it is, is the creativity process. Uh, and then some of it is just hammering it out. So if you can create a systems, you know, we, uh, there's a great tool called Pitchbox that allows you to build um, really custom outreach campaigns. Um, I think there's opportunities for scaling in terms of outreach if, that, if you're gonna go in that direction. And, and you know, I say outreach, I don't just mean what we were talking about earlier, which is like, 
hey, I saw your pose, please link to mine. Like really much more, you'd have to have Pitchbox show you what they're doing because it's really, really sophisticated. Um, but I think there's opportunities to scale that. But in terms of coming up with great quality content, like it's ideas, it's, it's, it's local knowledge, it's like getting, uh, having conversations with your clients, it's getting to know their local community, it's going deep on Google Maps, um, you know, it's researching what people in that local, if your client's local community are caring about and writing about, like what's in the news, um, and that doesn't scale great. Okay. Thank you, Guy. Uh, even though you said you, you weren't the right person to ask, uh, you obviously were. Um, I guess one, one, one final question. Final question for you, Guy. Um, what are your top three sort of tips summary for when someone is thinking uh, about uh, link building? Let's say your, your brother's starting an agency uh, and you know, he comes to you and says, you know, what do I got to get right? What, should, what are the three, th three things I've got to know about this? What advice would you give him? Start with the prospecting. Uh, get really good at link prospecting on a local level. Get familiar with the local community, the local news sources, the local uh, schools, the local community. Like, what's it like there? What do people care about? Like, are there, there might be local influencers. Um, that's number one is know that local community. Uh, number two, it's going to take time, especially if you're starting from ground zero. So uh, understand the competitive environment. Who are the major players? And the major players in local pack search might not be the same players as in traditional search, and they might not be the same competitors that your client thinks are the competition, right? So we talk to lawyers all the time and like, who are your competitors? And they'll name people and we go to their sites and they're like, this is not your competitor in search, and especially in local pack search. Um, number three, Metalinks. links. I mean, you, you got to get all the other stuff right. You got to get GMB right. You got to get citations right. But think about the things that your competition can't do. Uh, in links, go after the links that other people can't get for a variety of reasons, whether they're not going to invest in the uh, relationship, they're not going to invest the time, or they're not going to invest the, the money in sponsoring or um, being an event partner. Find where there's gaps in your competitor's link profile and go attack those. Okay, brilliant. Guy, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, we'll leave it there. Taking up uh, more than your time. Uh, you've been fantastic. You answered everything brilliantly. I think we got through around 20, uh, 20 of the questions, at least the most popular ones, which is great, and many, many more. Uh, so, Guy, um, thanks, thanks a lot for kind of taking part again. We'd love to have you back at some point, and uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll entice you back. Um, Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this, and uh, these have been great. I mean, I've been following along as well. Keep up the great work. You've got a lot of great experts. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. And uh, thanks for all those of that tuned in to listen to me rant about local link building. Uh, I can't say it any better than that. So uh, let's sign off there.